I'm Ashton Addison from BlockWest Capital for Investment Pitch Media. And today on the Crypto Coin Show, we have Peter Chris, co founder and CEO of Mangata Finance, back on the show with us. Peter, welcome back. Hi, Ashton. Great to be here again. Likewise, it, a lot has happened in uh, DeFi since. 2021, uh, and it was a, a very exciting time. And I know your team has grown strong and looking towards the future of DeFi, trading cryptocurrencies across different blockchains, cross-chain swaps. Um, and I'm excited to dive into all of that today. I would love to kick off our conversation with a high-level overview of Mangata Finance, what you and your team have been working on for those who aren't familiar with it or haven't seen our last interview. And then we'll dive into all the recent updates and uh, the future of DeFi. Thanks, Ashton. Uh, Mangata Finance is a decentralized cross-chain liquidity <coughs> protocol that enables a liquidity of native pairs across multiple blockchains. Uh, we have evolved from Polkadot, where we have built this new blockchain uh, that should attract liquidity and people can freely trade and people can have the benefit of new types of pairs that don't exist anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, we are taking this blockchain and we are connecting it to multiple layer ones out there. So right now there is very popular uh, thing going on around Ethereum rollups and rollups in general in, uh, in crypto. What we're basically doing is that imagine one zero knowledge rollup that is connected to multiple EVMs and is connected even to other blockchains that are non EVM. And by the thing that this rollup is connected to, to multiple blockchains, it can facilitate certain features that are non-existent in DeFi right now. So imagine uh, you can have a native liquidity of native Ethereum with the native Bitcoin, and all of this can be facilitated through Mangara. Hmm. So it's something like, uh, imagine back in the days, there used to be these uh, liquidity networks that were trying to connect blockchains, but right now we are building this roll-up centric technology that gives users much bigger security benefits and guarantees. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's break that down a little bit more. So Mangata is developed on the Polkadot blockchain technology. However, you're able to trade with Ethereum assets to other blockchains as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about the current state of DeFi or decentralized trading, where it seems a lot of it is in isolated silos and there are ways to transfer cryptocurrencies across different blockchains, but it's really doesn't seem optimal at this point. Exactly. Uh, you've touched a really pressing point of crypto right now that we have seen the development of so many different layers, different blockchains right now, but all the value is sitting in, in their own <laughs> islands, right? The blockchains do not communicate with each other and it's a problem. Usually, you know, the naive solution is usually just, just bridges, right? So you take Ethereum and you bridge it to, to Solana. But this is a bit of a problem because the bridged assets are always less secure than their native mm -hmm. L1 counterparts. You know, the problem of bridges is that bridge is always introducing the these, this new economic security layer on top of existing assets. And I have to say, the user experience is a bit clunky. The trust of users in such solutions is not so high. And me personally, I'm already getting tired of seeing another bridge being hacked, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's, it's not even a question of when the, or like if the bridge will be hacked. It's always a question when the bridge will be hacked. So I think it's a, it's a troublesome technology. And I remember back in the days, you know, in 2017, uh, or 2016, uh, and there was this trend, it was really popular, uh, atomic swaps. They work until this day. You can, you can exchange Bitcoin to Litecoin through this atomic swap type of technology that is embedded in Bitcoin and Litecoin. Uh, and you can, it, this is something like this proto interchain decentralized <coughs> exchange, you know, they're like, like this first glimpse of how the future could look like and i and i believe that this is on a conceptual level this is something that's very correct like how blockchains should interact with each other mm. and i know that even vitalik has raised concerns that he doesn't see the multi-chain future as using bridges too much he rather is, expects 
some atomic swap protocols to emerge mm -hmm. out of crypto. And this is exactly what we're enabling in DeFi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's there's another another angle to this, and this is that a lot of such liquidity is sitting on centralized exchanges, right? So you when when someone wants to bridge, for instance, from Ethereum to Polkadot, they deposit Ethereum to some exchange, they exchange it for DOT, and then they withdraw that DOT to Polkadot. They want to avoid bridges at all costs. But mm -hmm. what we are enabling is that we are enabling the same use case as centralized exchanges are currently operating but we're bringing it to DeFi. And mm -hmm. DeFi can now enjoy the same use case in a very secure manner, exchange your Ethereum for DOT or for Solana and without touching any type of bridge technology at all. Mm -hmm. Great. And could you walk me through how exactly that would work if I had Ethereum and I wanted to change that into Solana? Would I have to go into the Polkadot ecosystem or have Polkadot coins to do so through Mangata? No, you, you can do that without even being aware that it's touching Polkadot at all. You know, at, in, in the engine, we're using Polkadot finality and we're using Starquare's ZK proofs to verify the correctness of the swap execution to respective layer ones. Uh, but you as a user of just using the, the front end interface, you are not aware of the Polkadot. And it works in a very similar way from what you are used to in centralized exchanges. So mm -hmm. you take your Ethereum, you make a deposit. Once it's deposited on Mangata blockchain, then you can swap it for, let's say, Solana, and then you withdraw Solana to Solana without even knowing that you have touched Polkadot or, mm -hmm. or anything under underneath, all within your existing wallet. Wow, that's great. I feel like you mentioned there about the atomic swaps. I feel like that's been something that's been uh, a dream of, of people on decentralized exchanges for a few years. Uh, and it, it currently it's fairly easy to use decentralized exchanges between, you know, in one single ecosystem. But why don't, why do you think you know, over the few years that DeFi has been growing that this hasn't happened sooner, make it easier to connect these blockchains? Because it's problematic and uh, let's say on a conceptual level, the technology haven't matured yet so that we could do it in some trustless way. You know, there are many, many middleware blockchains that are trying to facilitate some, some trend, not, not even transfers, uh, even some messages or something like Oracle networks mm -hmm. or uh, messaging bridges. All of them are in principle, they are some bridge technology. And bridge technology is secure only up to the point of their own native token security. So that means like if you're using some, some Oracle network or you're using some, some bridge, it's only secure as far as the capitalization of its native token, hmm. right? And that is, that is problematic because again, it always introduces the, uh, the new uh, like, like economic security concerns. Another problem with, with like liquidity networks uh, we've seen many of those solutions like that, is that the liquidity networks usually work that the node operators, they hold an inventory of assets on both chains, right? And then when you trade, you trade against that inventory of assets. Or if you provide liquidity, you essentially delegate that liquidity to the node operators of, of that liquidity network. But again, this is problematic because the blockchain that is operating the, the liquidity network has to come up with a lot of measures how to prevent node operators from stealing the liquidity, from stealing users' money. And even those node operators, they can prevent you from withdrawing the assets. And again, this is really problematic. And I believe this is one of the blockers why such solutions didn't get the mass adoption yet. Mm -hmm. With our architecture, where we, we call it multi rollup interchain architecture. So in our architecture, we have a blockchain and that blockchain contains multiple rollups or multiple layer truths from different blockchains. And rollups have this uh, very nice feature or security assumption that all the assets that are deposited on the rollup, they sort of enjoy the L1 security and they have this thing called escape hatches. So for instance, if you deposit to some 
uh, optimism or arbitrary. And given that they have implemented escape hatches technology, uh, the user have guaranteed that the assets are all the time withdrawable, even in case if the blockchain would go down. So if the liveliness, liveness of the blockchain would uh, completely disappear. And this is a great feature. So you as a liquidity provider or you as a trader, you can always be sure that your assets are secure when you are trading mm. through Mangara interchain, um, multi rollup interchain infrastructure. Mm. That's great, Peter. And speaking of the, the rollups into these different layer two ecosystems, you're pretty in touch with uh, DeFi and the smaller chains as you're interconnecting them through Mangara. You know, a lot of people that trade normally on centralized exchanges, they just hear of trading on a DEX like Uniswap and using Ethereum and that there is a lot of downsides based on the cost or you know the, the, the price for the gas can be uh, unpredictable and it can be very high. Uh, what do you think of these other roll-ups that have come in and you know sort of getting rid of that fallacy that people think of that aren't really in decentralized trading? Do you think all of these other roll-ups and my goddess technology has so far made an improvement to people actually wanting to trade on decentralized exchanges? Definitely. When you compare solutions like Uniswap or any other DEXs that are sitting on, on L1 Ethereum, uh, they always inherit and they are limited by the design of, of the layer one or by the Ethereum itself. When you go into the roll-up world, you can suddenly enjoy this new plethora of solutions that that can customize certain aspects and make user experience or certain security guarantees much better for the user. So for instance, you have the ZK VMs, right? So uh, they offer performance because like the ZK is, is much more performant than an optimistic way. Uh, you can enable some privacy features so that people are having more private transactions, right? On the other thing is that because the rollup is essentially uh, taking the block space demand from layer one to multiple other silos and domains, the demand pressure for the L1 is lowered. And that means that you can enjoy much lower gas. Or you can go even with other dire direction that this is what we have done and we have already developed and deployed in, in production on our testnet right now, is that we have MEV minimization and gas-free swaps out of the box. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the thing that has been damaging users experience for quite some time you know when you're trading as, as a user on, on a typical dax uh, you do not only pay the fixed cost of 0 0.3 percent per trade you always pay this unpredictable cost of gas and unpredictable costs of mev and this mm. is really problematic so imagine you're even a professional trading firm right so you're mm -hmm. you're trading thousands of trades per hour per day and you do not have control over your costs. Again, this is a huge problem if DeFi wants to scale to a more mature and let's say more professional infrastructure play. Uh, and this is what Mangana is, is bringing to the market. So uh, independent of having this connection to multiple blockchains, on top of that, we have MEV minimized. I'm not saying it's completely solved because MEV cannot be solved at all, but it can be minimized and on top of that, we have this economic model where we can provide only fixed costs for traders where they do not care about the gas at all. Mm -hmm. Thanks for those insights, Peter. And can you talk a little bit more in explanation on the MEV? I think a lot of people that are trading don't understand uh, what exactly it is and, and what are those associated costs or the risks involved. In, in simple terms, MEV is a thing that you as a user you pay indirectly to various bots that are trying to exploit your trade. In practice, it looks like you want to buy a token for $100 on some decentralized exchange. But after the trade, you find out that you have paid $20 more. You have mm. paid 20% bigger costs. Wow. And this is exactly because some bot has, for instance, jumped in front of your trade. He pushed the price much higher to your detriment. And once your trade is finished, they just capitalize a, pr a pure profit after your trade is finished. But it is always the user who gets to have to pay the costs for this type of exploit. Wow. 
And with the introduction of the, the ZK technology and these roll-ups, whether it's zero knowledge for having lower gas fees with you know low, uh, less information having to be confirmed or privacy of your transactions, does that help with lowering those costs or preventing bots from front running you in decentralized trading? Yeah, I would uh, make this debate a bit more nuanced because usually people think that the ZK technology enables privacy uh, like by default, but that's not true. Uh, the ZK is most, in most cases, it's used as a, as a performance thing because mm. you suddenly just can compute proofs off-chain and the only thing that the Ethereum layer 1 needs to do is just verify the proofs and the layer 1 has now uh, guaranteed that the, whatever happened off-chain was correctly executed. So this is a really nice feature of the of the, Z, of the zero knowledge. Of course, later on it can be used even for some privacy use cases, but uh, currently we still have to see a development of, of, of some of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and sorry, what was the, the second part of the question? Yeah, no, just about save, if saving the costs, if that would actually help with the roll-ups from MEV. Yeah, for sure. And then as a roll-up, you can employ these new types of measures that are impossible to employ on, on Ethereum layer one. So again, let's go to Uniswap or SushiSwap or, or whatever. Uh, they cannot essentially employ MEV minimization strategies because that would require a deep consensus changes. They, that would require changes on a, on a deep layers of technology. And th that is really problematic because Ethereum is already too big. Ethereum already holds too much value at, at risk. Mm -hmm. So Ethereum cannot afford to do huge changes on, on the protocol, on the consensus level. But now in the, in the roll-up space, you suddenly have this greenfield, right? You are building things from scratch. So you can design it proper, properly as, as you have a chance to build it like like from, from the bottom, right? And there you can employ new types of MEV um, prevention mechanisms uh, that, that prevents MEV. Usually Ethereum layer one works in a, uh, with, the, with the redistribution in mind. So uh, in the case where the bot has, has stolen $20 worth of, of your trade, you usually get it back as redistributed from mm -hmm. some other solution. So, after all, the user do not have to pay like all the costs to the MEV. But again, this is a bit problematic because the value has to travel uh, to some bot, then again to some solution, and that solution should give you your money back, and it will never give you 100% of your money back. We believe it's it's much more efficient and much much frictionless when the MEV is prevented and minimized from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Peter. And last time we spoke, it was 2021, you know, DeFi was, uh, all of crypto was going crazy. The DeFi TVL was very high. And there was also a lot of outside interest in, in DeFi, in part because people were hearing about high APYs and, and different ways to stake and earn a lot of cash. Um, but since then, you know, obviously the market goes in cycles and Bitcoin and Ethereum are lower than they were in, in 2021. And the DeFi TVL naturally is lower as well. I'm curious on your thoughts on the progression of DeFi as an industry since 2021, despite what the TVL shows. Um, have you seen a lot of updates and steps towards more mainstream and, and widespread adoption of DeFi since we last spoke? I believe we are right now in a, in a bear market, but all these cycles are natural, you know, um, they go within a few years, we go up, then we go down, then we go up again. It's just a natural order of things. Uh, I think DeFi has grown up a lot. So now we have this phase of uh, having DeFi products and projects to get more professional and more serious about security, uh, more serious about the economic sustainability of their um, of the of the models of everything that that works uh, of the whole economy that is flowing through through DeFi, right? So so this is this is the first thing. Second thing is that DeFi in the in the first cycle has operated mostly with with the retail money or let's say with with the end users money, mm -hmm. uh, but again like people or the world is is much bigger place and we have still yet to capture a lot of money that is sitting outside of crypto. Mm -hmm. 
so that though that capital would trust DeFi more to deploy the capital. And for this, uh, I believe we are lacking regulatory clarity, mm -hmm. right? So imagine that there are big funds or there is big capital sitting outside of uh, of crypto or out of out of DeFi. And even if they would really like to deploy capital to, to DeFi, it's impossible because there is just too much regulatory risk. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, the bigger the bigger the company or bigger the legal entity is, the more risk averse it is and the more clarity on the regulatory side um, it expects. And without the regulatory clarity, we won't have this new inflow of capital. So I believe that the most important thing that crypto or DeFi has to solve right now is to get politicians in Washington and Brussels uh, to get much more clear stance on DeFi. And once that happens, uh, we can have this new inflow of, of capital. Mm. Great point, Peter. And I think at this point, a lot of these large companies and institutions, some in private, some have announced it, but they're still focused mainly just on you know, Bitcoin, which is sort of the gatekeeper of getting into DeFi and cryptocurrencies. You know, if unless they're unless they're 100% comfortable with holding Bitcoin, they're probably not going to be comfortable in some DeFi lending protocol that's decentralized, borrowing millions of dollars from who knows who, just some smart contract. Exactly, but I'm actually I am actually positive on this. You know, it uh, it has some really nice uh, developments. And I believe within one year, uh, we can get much better stance from, mm. from the regulatory. That's great. And last time we spoke in, in 2021, you and your team were, were hard at work on Mangata and now you're in a testnet phase. Can you talk about what exactly that means and if users can go there now and, and test different things and what's available to actually try? Yeah. Right now we're running this economic testnet. What is economic testnet? That means that the solution is still not the full-fledged solution that we expect, but there is already some economic value that can be tested by users. Uh, we're running this on this Kusama, which is the sister network of the Polkadot, and people can already try the user interface. They can try to trade tokens. They can try to inject liquidity and play around with, with several tokens. And once we deploy this connection to Ethereum, there already will be this, these new pairs like Ethereum Kusama or Ethereum and something else. And that can bring people these new use cases in, in very, very short time. Hmm. Very exciting. And what are the next steps for you and your team uh, leading towards the end of this year and eventually into the next phases of testnet or mainnet? Yeah, right now we're already developing this multi rollup infrastructure. Uh, we are working with, with Starkware uh, very closely mm -hmm. and we are uh, using their zero knowledge technology to build this uh, proving mechanism to, to Ethereum layer one. Uh, I expect that this will should be possible to be tested by users by the early next year and this will be the time when we will unveil a lot of like like practical uh, practical details of, of the end user uh, development but in the meantime I invite everyone to we have just published a new paper uh, it's mm -hmm. quite bigger I would say but I invite everyone to review it read it and uh, give us uh, comments or if anyone wants to join and help us with polishing and pinpointing uh, mm -hmm. Anything that uh, people think might be better, uh, they are they are very welcome. Very exciting, Peter. And I can leave the link to the paper in the notes below as well. Uh, what are any of the other places where people can go and speak to others who who are trying it out, or uh, the the links to the actual application? Yeah, the, another great meeting point for Mangara is Mangara's Discord and Mangara's Twitter. That's where all the things are happening. Um, we're happy for any new people that just want to even consult or they just want to even inspect our MEV solution, our guest free solution. There are so many things that you can look into, which are pretty unique in, in crypto. So uh, I'd be happy if someone comes or new people come and they can uh, chat through. Sounds great, Peter. I can leave all the links in the notes below. Appreciate your insights into DeFi and where the industry's at right now and trying to make it a safer and, and better place to trade cross-chain 
swaps and with the multi roll up interchain. I'm excited for what's to come with Mangata. So all the best with you and your team on this work here so far. And let's follow up in the near future. Thank you, Ashton. It was great to be here again.